Hello, everyone, and welcome to the first gathering of the Behavior, Evolution, and Culture series of this academic year. As you can see, we are continuing to host this series virtually, at least through the fall quarter. Before introducing today's speaker, I'd like to take a moment to discuss the Frank Marlowe Memorial Lectures. Frank Marlowe earned his PhD at UCLA in 2007 as a student of Nicholas Blurton Jones. Building on his PhD research with Nick, Frank dedicated much of his career to working with Hadza hunter-gatherers in Northern Tanzania. His research spans several traditions in evolutionary science, including human behavioral ecology, evolutionary psychology, and cross-cultural research. He made important and lasting contributions to all of these fields. He was a de dedicated field worker, a very prolific scholar, and he was a very supportive mentor. I had the great fortune to be his PhD student and to be introduced to the Hadza by him. Frank's scholarship and advising in matters both scientific and personal had a lasting impact on me and many of his other students. Frank tragically developed early onset Alzheimer's disease and he passed away in 2019, almost two years to the day. During his later years, he was lovingly cared for by his family in Athens, Georgia. Working with Julia Marlowe and Mike Gervin, uh, we've written a memorial to Frank and his work that can be viewed at frankmarlowarchives.com. In addition, several touching memorials to Frank uh, have been published elsewhere in Anthropology News and in the journal Human Nature. None of us can possibly do justice to everything that Frank was as a person and as a scholar, but do read these uh, essays to get a sense for Frank Marlowe's work, his humble and his sensitive demeanor, and his ever curious and very adventurous spirit that we all remember so well. The pandemic unfortunately stymied plans that had been made to memorialize Frank's work in 2020. But today it's my great pleasure to host you all here today for the first Frank Marlowe Memorial Lecture at UCLA. The lecture series has been established from a generous donation from Frank's family. This lectureship to be hosted by Beck will bring to UCLA some of the world's finest scholars in areas of research that Frank worked on. On behalf of all of us in Beck, I wish to express my deep gratitude to Frank's family for their remarkable gift. It is truly an honor for Beck to be the home to this fitting tribute to Frank and his scholarship. This year we'll be hosting several Frank Marlow Memorial Lectures, all of which will be given by researchers whose work echoes themes of research of Frank's own interests and whom also personally knew him. And there's much more that can and should be said about Frank and it's my hope that these memorial lectures will provide a way to keep these conversations going. This brings me to my introduction of our first speaker of the year, Herman Ponser. Herman happened to have been a graduate student in the Department of Anthropology at Harvard University during the period in which Frank was a faculty member there. And I know directly and indirectly, Frank's had a big impact on Herman's research. Herman Ponser is an associate professor in evolutionary anthropology and global health at Duke University. He has made seminal contributions to understanding the biomechanics and evolution of locomotion, the evolution and ecology of metabolism and energy use, and the relationships between metabolism, lifestyle, physical activity, and health. His recent book, Burn provides a highly readable account that synthesizes his research on these topics. And among many of the fantastic scientific discoveries that Herman has made, he also interweaves in some really fun anecdotes, including those that cover our work together in Tanzania over the last decade. So thank you, Herman. It's great to have you here and we look forward to seeing your talk. And Frank was there, he's a faculty member there at Harvard in the same department. And um, yeah, just a lot of influence just from conversations I had with him over the years um, and courses I was able to take with him. And, and I just feel really lucky to have known him. And um, I, as I said, he also influenced some of the work that I'll talk about today. And I'll, I'll mention that as I go along. Uh, but so just to kind of start where I usually start with these kinds of, with the research I've been doing, um, and that is thinking about the evolutionary context um, in which humans evolved. And you know we could go into a, a lot of different detail here, but this is kind of where I like to start with things, especially uh, you know, try to start broadly and work our way 
uh, more into more and more detail. We split from chimpanzees and bonobos about 7 million years ago. Probably a lot of you are familiar with this. Um, but our own genus, the genus Homo, which gets started about oh, two, two and a half million years ago, um, it's a hunting and gathering genus. And that's the critical adaptation, hunting and gathering, uh, that allows us to, you know, to sort of in inhabit all the different ecozones uh, of the world, basically. And our species, Homo sapiens, is just the most recent uh, twig from the uh, the Homo, the genus Homo family tree. And so we're a hunting and gathering species from a hunting and gathering uh, genus. And that was something that Frank knew, of course, uh, very well and, and, and grounded a lot of his work too, thinking in explicitly evolutionary terms about human ecology, uh, human behavior, and, and, you know, and hunter gatherer ecology specifically. And so, you know, this is grounds my work as well. Um, and I've been interested in uh, how the body evolved in a hunting and gathering context and how uh, the, that hunting and gathering legacy has affected the way that our bodies work today in the sort of uh, weird and um, very derived cities and supermarkets uh, that we find ourselves in today. Um, and specifically to ask the question whether or not this sort of abrupt change over only a couple of generations from a, a subsistence economy um, marked specifically by hunting and gathering uh, prior to farming, um, a, a change from that to a very industrialized way of life has affected our health. And so um, this is a question that has uh, energized a lot of public health over the past well, few decades, actually, uh, going back at least to, to James Neal and the thrifty genotype hypothesis back in the 60s. Uh, but it has really come on in the last couple of decades as a really important perspective in public health. And it's, it's one that's animated a lot of my work today. And uh, specifically, it's animated a lot of my work thinking about um, human energy expenditure. So I, a lot of my work focuses on metabolism and how we spend energy. And of course, as we've changed our lifestyles so radically from hunting and gathering into in a more industrialized societies, it has radically changed the way that we get our energy and um, you know, we use it to fuel our bodies and also to reproduce and, and grow. Um, and yeah, I would argue that that sort of imbalance, those changes in the way that we get our energy and the way that we burn our energy have led to a lot of the modern diseases uh, that we're all too familiar with. So obesity and overweight are essentially um, uh, diseases of energy imbalance where we're eating more calories than we're burning off. We know that overweight and obesity uh, put us at higher risk for things like type two diabetes, uh, certain cancers, heart disease. And so a lot of the diseases of civilization that people have talked about over the last few decades, uh, we can really think about in many ways as diseases of energy imbalance. And so um, that has really motiv motivated me to kind of take the ecological and evolutionary work that I started doing in graduate school, thinking about how um, energy expenditure evolves and how metabolic strategies evolve in different species and think about it more holistically and broadly thinking about how it affects day-to-day -day life um, among humans in industrialized societies today and how that compares again to a hunting and gathering past. So that's what I wanna focus on today. I wanna to focus on uh, energy expenditure across three time scales and think about how um, energy expenditure uh, evolves over sort of deep evolutionary time and how human energy expenditure has evolved in, in, in our lineage. Um, I wanna think about how energy expenditure changes with lifestyle. So as we uh, mark the change from hunting and gathering to farming to industrialized lifestyles, uh, how do those changes affect the way that our bodies consume and burn energy? And then over the course of our own lives, uh, as we age, how does energy expenditure change that way? And again, my focus on energy expenditure is really um, uh, motivated by the idea that there's just no more sort of direct measure of our physiology than the way our cells are, are working away um, burning energy. So all of your cells activities uh, throughout the day are captured when we measure total daily energy expenditures, which I've been measuring the last decade or so. And so it's a great sort of uh, catch all measure of, of how busy our bodies are and what they're up to. Anyway, so I'm going to walk through these three different timescales today um, and talk about evidence for each. And, um, and let's get started. So the first I'll talk about uh, sort of briefly is how human energy expenditure evolved. And this is work that, you know, uh, when I think about uh, a lot of this work, I, I think immediately about Frank's contributions in this area and conversations I had with him. Um, when I was a graduate student, Frank was working on this paper. Uh, and for those of you who know, it, it's a really foundational paper in human uh, 
you know, human evolution, human uh, hunter-gatherer ecology. And it takes a very broad view of humans and puts us in a sort of comparative context. Frank's got a great table in here uh, comparing human ecology and different, different variables to those of, of course, chimpanzees and bonobos, but also to lions and, and, uh, and, and social carnivores. And um, so, so Frank liked to think broadly and was, was great to have these conversations with as my ideas were coming together in his work too for this work. So definitely influenced here uh, by Frank. Anyway, so here's your human family tree with a, a timeline on our branch. And we're one of the ape, uh, members of the ape family. And uh, when I started this work, uh, coming out of graduate school and, and starting off my career as an assistant professor, um, we didn't really have any measurements, or not, not many measurements, of daily energy expenditure for primates. We had measures of basal metabolic rates, which are the energy expenditure that you use when you're resting. But of course, that only captures a really small portion. Um, well, I shouldn't say small, it can be a, quite a large portion, but it only captures a portion of our total calories burned per day. Uh, and so I was curious to understand how uh, different species of primates and how primates as a group for that matter compared to other mammals uh, consume and burn energy uh, compared to other mammals. And so I got uh, interested in using this new technique called the doubly labeled water technique. And I won't bore you with those details, but basically we use isotopes of water to track the body's production of carbon dioxide over about a week to 10 days. And so for everybody that we measure with this, and we can measure this in humans or, uh, or any other animal, um, we can measure sort of a week to 10 day average of, of total daily energy expenditure, all the calories burned per day. And it's a very accurate, precise measure because it allows us to measure the carbon dioxide that the body produces. And you can't make carbon dioxide without burning calories or burning calories without making carbon dioxide. And so when we, the, the first uh, study I'll talk to you about was this one, uh, looking at primates as a group. So with Steve Ross and a lot of other collaborators, Steve Ross is at the Lincoln Park Zoo, uh, we were able to go out and capture energy expenditure measurements using this doubly labeled water technique for a wide range of primate species um, and add those to what was known in literature already. There was a handful and understand something really fundamental about primates in general. So I want to walk you through this graph because I'm going to show you a lot of graphs like this today. On the x-axis here is body mass. Um, on the y-axis is total energy expenditure measured in with the, the um, isotope tracking technique I just mentioned, the doubly labeled water technique. So these are real measurements of energy expenditure. And notice these are log log scales. And so primates here as a group, all in red, are shifted low beneath the other placental mammals. And in log log space, it doesn't look like a big difference, but that's a 50% decrease or 50% reduction in energy expenditure in primates. So we humans in, uh, as well, we're, we're on this graph as well. Um, we are part of a very slow metabolism group. And we think that's really important because, uh, you know, as I was saying, there's no more fundamental measurement of what your body's up to every day and how busy your cells are than your metabolic rate. And we think that that slow rate of energy expenditure reflects the primates' really slow rate of growth, reproduction, and aging. So finally, here we have a mechanism for why primates and humans too have such slow life histories, right, where we grow over the course of, you know, 10 to 20 years of spent growing up. And then these long uh, adult lifespans that might reach into the 70s, 80s, or 90s. And you know, th that slow life history, that's a really, we, we, we age and, and grow and reproduce really slowly for, uh, for a mammal. Um, other primates do too, and we think this is because of the slow metabolic rate. But what happens then when we zoom in on just the part of the family tree that we see here above in gray, just us and the other apes? Well, if we zoom in there, we see a, a slightly different picture. Here is fat-free mass against total energy expenditure. And now instead of every dot being a population, now every dot is a, is a participant, it's an individual. So every gray dot here is a human, every blue dot here is a chimp or a bonobo, every, red, every green dot is a gorilla, every orange dot is an orangutan. And as I think you can see here, that for all apes, as you get bigger, you burn more energy. But humans have elevated expenditures above what we see in chimps and bonobos, and for that matter, for all the other apes too. Uh, humans are a high energy expenditure species. And we can see this not just in total energy expenditure, but we can also see this um, in our basal metabolic rates too, and I'll show you in a second. And we think that this is really critical for uh, the adaptations that separate humans from the other species of apes. So the things that Frank was focused on in that evolutionary anthropology paper are large brains, are uh, large babies, 
Um, the fact that, that humans um, can have babies more often than the other uh, hominoid species can, can manage. All of that, all of those sort of classic key human adaptations take energy and we fuel that with a faster metabolism. So here I've shown you, instead of showing it to you as a, a plotted against body mass, I've shown you total energy expenditure predicted for a 55 kilogram fat-free mass male or female. And you can see the sort of stepped like relationship between this, the species here. Notably, humans aren't just the highest metabolism ape, we're also the fattest ape. And so humans carry much more fat, as you can see left here of the, in yellow on the yellow bars than the other apes do, which I would suggest is an adaptation to those high metabolic rates. If you have a high, uh, if, you, if you burn your energy quickly, then you need to develop a faster, a larger reserve fuel tank. I think that's what the, the fat, uh, larger fat mass in humans is all about. Um, anyway, so humans are not just a high energy ape, we're also the fattest ape. And I think that this helps provide a kind of uh, insight into how humans evolved the key traits that we, we that, that separate us from the other apes, our expensive brains, big babies, long lives. Okay, so that's a, a quick tour of that first question, but um, I think it points to just how flexible metabolic strategies can be. Humans are the high energy ape. Uh, we're also quite fat <laughs> for, for the other apes. Uh, for example, chimpanzees in the zoo only get up to about 10% body fat, even though they're, they're quite sedentary. 10% uh, body fat in a human would be sort of Olympic level uh, caliber. So uh, we're a very fat and high energy ape. And so we can see that metabolic strategies can evolve over time, um, given the right selection pressures. We'd be fun to discuss what those selection pressures might be with you. Um, but I want to move on to where I'll spend most of the time today, which is talking about um, how energy expenditure can change with lifestyle. Because of course, if energy expenditure can evolve over time, then we might very well expect that it might also change depending on the lifestyle that we lead, if we're more active or more sedentary. And of course, this is a question that's been um, a, a big focus in public health. Uh, humans evolved as hunter-gatherers for, for over 2 million years. Um, and as far as we can tell from ethnographic accounts, as well as from more detailed work that um, I've had a chance to do in collaboration with Brian Wood and, and others. Um, Hunter-gatherers are incredibly healthy. So when humans uh, live in the kinds of, uh, of, of lifestyles in which we evolved, um, we tend to stay uh, healthy in important ways. We, we tend to not get sick uh, from the things that make people in industrialized societies sick. So in hunter-gatherer and other subsistence economy populations, obesity rates are vanishingly low, uh, type 2 diabetes is vanishingly rare. Uh, there's very little evidence for any kind of heart disease. And of course, infectious disease is a, is a big killer in these populations without access to uh, antibiotics and vaccines. Um, but, you know, one, one common critique is that, well, the, you know, hunter-gatherers might not, populations might not get these diseases of civilization because they don't live long enough to get them. But actually, if you live to 15, um, if you get through that early, uh, period of, of where, where infectious disease is really a serious mortality risk, you can expect to live into your 50s, 60s, and even later. So the life expectancy at 15 is actually quite good, and, and you still don't see these diseases of civilization. Um, so that raises the question, right? How have activity and energy expenditure and diet changed uh, today in ways that, that make us sick from these diseases of civilization in ways that, that hunter-gatherers avoid? Um, this is a, a question that I got interested in in around 2008 or 9. And just as there weren't any measurements or, or there weren't many measurements of, uh, of energy expenditures in non-human primates using doubly labeled water, there were no measures of energy expenditure using doubly labeled water in any hunting and gathering groups. And this was obviously a, a big issue that we needed to address, a, a big hole in, the, in the, what we knew that we wanted to, to fill. Um, and so I got really excited about doing that. And uh, with Brian Wood and with Dave Reichlin, um, I developed this Hadza Energetics Project. And we started this in 2008 or nine. And I, I wanna also tip my hat to Frank Marlowe. This is another case where his, his influence was really important and really big. Um, I ended up in the field uh, with Dave and Brian, but actually when we first started thinking about how to develop this project, uh, I was working with Frank to think about how we would do this. So conversations with Frank about how we would be able to do doubly labeled water measurements um, in, the, in the Hadza community, um, how we would get this project off the ground, how we would get the permits for it, the logistics for it. 
Um, and Frank had a lot of key insights, both practical and theoretical, that you know, without him, this project would have never happened. And so uh, I really, I owe him a lot uh, just, just to help get this project off the ground, really uh, foundational input from him on this. Um, anyway, for those who don't know, probably mo most of you do here, but I'll just, uh, it's always fun to, to talk about the Hadza community. They're an amazing population of folks living in Northern Tanzania. Um, uh, many of them are still hunting and gathering, so they don't have any domesticated crops or domesticated animals or machines or guns or electricity or plumbing. Instead, they live in uh, grass houses in this sort of arid sa uh, savanna landscape in Northern Tanzania around the Lake Yasi region. Um, and they get a lot of physical activity, as you can imagine. So women leave camp together uh, to collect plant foods. They get about 13,000 steps a day uh, based on analyses that, that Brian Wood just uh, published recently this last spring. Um, and it's not just walking. So they're also collecting a lot of food. Sometimes it's not too hard. You're collecting berries like this woman is on the left. Uh, but often you're digging into rocky soil, uh, you know, maybe carrying a kid on your back. Uh, and, and here on the right, you see a woman collecting wild tubers using a digging stick to dig into the soil. So it's a really physically strenuous way to make a living. Uh, men are also very active. They walk about 12 kilometers a day. Um, Brian's analysis says they get about 19,000 steps a day. Um, so an enormous amount of physical activity hunting. They also climb trees and chop into the, the hollows of large baobab trees to get honey. Um, and so it's, it's a really physically strenuous lifestyle, as you can imagine. And so to put some numbers on that, uh, this is an analysis that Dave Reichlin did. If you look at uh, what we call moderate and vigorous physical activity every day, Hadza men and women get about 120 minutes a day of daily physical activity. And you can see how that compares uh, to other populations. So industrialized populations get very, very little uh, moderate and vigorous physical activity every day. Uh, Hadza hunter-gatherers get a bunch. And so in 2008 and nine, as we we're developing this project, uh, in conversations with Frank and other people as well, um, we were trying to think about how we would go and understand how this kind of lifestyle, this physically strenuously active lifestyle, affected the energy expenditure of people um, in this lifestyle compared to industrialized lifestyles. And the idea would be, uh, we would try to get a measure of how much more energy Hadza adults burn every day compared to sedentary Westerners. And our thought was that this would help, under, help us understand, perhaps, why obesity, which is a, a problem of not burning as many calories as you eat, um, why obesity is a problem in the West and in, in other industrialized countries. Um, it might help us understand as well why exercise and physical activity is so good for us, which we know it is from, from lots of epidemiological work. Uh, and so we, we use this doubly labeled water method here. Here's a Hadza man drinking his dose of doubly labeled water uh, to measure total daily energy expenditures, all the calories burned per day, and Hadza men and women. And we came back and, and uh, analyzed those samples at a lab in Baylor with Bill Wong, a leading lab in this kind of work. And we compared those results, the energy expenditure from hot to men and women to men and women from the industrialized world, from the US and countries in Europe and Japan and countries in Asia that are industrialized. And we expected to see a really elevated energy expenditure um, in Hadza men and women compared to Westerners. And here's what we actually found. So here's daily energy expenditure again against fat-free mass. And every dot here is a person and every open dot is a woman and every closed dot is a man. And you can see very clearly just by eye here actually <laughs> that the Hadza hunter-gatherers have the same energy expenditures for a given body size as men and women in industrialized economies or market economies. And so this is a simple bivariate plot of daily energy expenditure against fat-free mass. Fat-free mass is, by the way, is, is by in a way the, the, the strongest single determinant of energy expenditure. But you can make more complicated models as well. You can control for fat mass or age or sex. Um, no matter how you want to slice it, there's no difference in daily energy expenditure between Hadza hunter-gatherers and relatively sedentary men and women living in the US and Europe and other industrialized countries. So this was a really huge kind of shocking result. Um, we didn't expect this at all. Uh, we were really surprised to find it. And so, you know, if, it's, if it was a robust result, of course, it, it kind of overturned a lot of what we thought we understood about 
uh, daily energy expenditure and how it relates to lifestyle and activity. And so this is suggesting that it doesn't matter if you're really physically active, you don't burn more calories. Somehow the body's compensating or adjusting. Uh, of course, if it was just the Hadza though, we could dismiss it or think, well, let's, it's just one population. So the next thing to do, of course, is to ask, what about other populations? Now, there aren't a whole lot of other populations that are still living these subsistence economy lifestyles, um, but we've been able to measure this in a few, and here's what that looks like. Uh, the next group I'll talk to you about is called the Shuar. Many of you are probably familiar with them as well, uh, but they're forager horticulturalists living in the Amazonian basin in Ecuador. Uh, this is work that was led by Sam Erlocker. Uh, while well, he was a postdoc in my lab, and, and Sam was particularly interested in energy expenditure among children in, in the Schwar population. And so Sam focused on uh, kids, uh, sort of elementary school-aged kids, and he was able to do a, a more complete study in many ways than we were able to do with that Hodge's work. Uh, and so I'll, I'll walk you through all the different parts that Sam was able to do. First, he actually had, um, well, we, we'd have this as well for the Hadza, but but Sam had um, activity measurements using accelerometry with a Schwar population versus uh, com other comparative samples from the industrialized world. So here's uh, Schwar kids activity counts. And as you can see, they are more physically active than populations in the, in the industrialized world. Uh, Sam also was able to get really careful measurements of basal metabolic rate. That's the energy expenditure rate while you're just laying down completely at rest um, fasted and thermal neutral, and just you know, your body is, is completely at rest for these measurements. And as you can see, the Schwar kids, so the Schwar here are in red, um, industrialized populations are in blue. The Schwar have elevated basal metabolic rates compared to children uh, of the same age and same body size uh, in industrialized populations. And in fact, we, we actually know, we think we know why that elevation persists. Um, if you look at how elevated uh, a Schwar child's um, basal metabolic rates are, it correlates nicely with this uh, finger prick blood measure that Sam was able to get of immunoglobulin G. This is a, a cytokine, this is a measure of immune system activity. And so the suggestion here is that uh, these kids have elevated basal metabolic rates because they have really active um, immune systems in these environments, which makes sense, right? They're not in these sort of aseptic environments that you and I live in. Um, instead, they're hitting every day. They're up against um, you know, pathogens, and their bodies are dealing with those that extra burden. Okay, so the Schwar children have elevated physical activity. They have elevated basal metabolic rates. So we should then, therefore, expect that they're going to have elevated total energy expenditures, right? I mean, of course, they must. They are spending more energy on activity. They're spending more energy on immune system. It looks like something for basal metabolic rate being elevated they should have higher total energy expenditures. So Sam, again, measured energy expenditure with the Schwar kids uh, and compared that to data from kids in the US and the UK. And here's what those data look like. There's actually no difference in total daily energy expenditure in Schwar children in red uh, compared to industrialized children, population children um, in blue. And that's, you know, again, I'm showing this to you in a simple bivariate manner but we can do this with uh, more complicated models controlling for other factors. And there just is no difference in total daily energy expenditure between these two groups. A real shocker. Again, lifestyle, I, I started this section of the talk talking about how we're gonna find out what lifestyle does to our daily energy expenditure. And it turns out lifestyle doesn't seem to be doing very much. Instead, our bodies seem to be uh, kind of compensating and keeping total daily energy expenditure within some narrow band. Um, now, one critique from this kind of, approach, and this you could apply this to the Hadza results as well, is that when you compare across populations like this, um, there are so many differences between these populations that it's, it can be hard to sort of necessarily say what's going on for sure and to say you know, it, what the different possible set of explanations could be because, there, again, there are so many differences uh, between these groups. And so Sam was able to do one better. Uh, here's what I just showed you, uh, just to walk you through this graph. Here we have daily energy expenditure. Um, and we, we're here, instead of showing this to you against body size, here I've said, okay, well, for a given body size, um, how much, what's the energy expenditure for a kid from these rural Schwar communities compared to kids from the industrialized uh, populations? And what I just showed you is this, that, that their total daily energy expenditure, the top edge of that bar, is the same, even though resting energy expenditures are a bit higher for the Schwar. 
But again, that's a between population comparison. Um, wouldn't it be nice to have a within population comparison? So we could compare Schwar children who have these um, traditional subsistence lifestyles to Schwar children who live in more uh, market integrated, uh, urbanized settings. Well, Sam was able to do that because the Schwar population is larger than the Hadza population. And there are communities within the Schwar population that live in towns uh, and have access to market foods. And so we can use them uh, as another comparative group here. And here's what this looks like. Um, we have it here as the urban Schwar, but I, I don't want to read too much into that. I don't think we would call most of these settings urban in the American uh, sense of, of big, you know, multi-million person cities. Um, but they are more settled, uh, more built up, and importantly, have more access to market foods uh, than the rural Schwar communities do. But here you can see that the total energy expenditure is no different, different, different among these populations. Um, even though uh, we do see differences in, in resident energy expenditure, resident energy expenditures among these uh, sort of peri urban Schwar children are about are intermediate between rural. Schwar and industrialized US samples. So total energy expenditures are not changing, um, even as lifestyle changes dramatically among these groups. Interestingly, though, we are seeing differences in other aspects of metabolic health. So if we look at fat percentage, for example, um, it's quite low. We'd expect this. We see this in other groups like the Hadza. Uh, quite low body fat percentages among Schwar children in rural groups. It's quite a bit higher among children in these peri-urban Schwar environments. And it's actually not so different than we see in, um, in westernized, industrialized populations of kids. And so we can actually say pretty confidently that because total energy expenditure is not changing here, that these differences in body composition cannot be due to differences in daily energy expenditure. If they were, we'd expect to see differences in that, but we don't see those differences. And instead, it suggests that this change in body fat is happening due to industrialization in the diet, uh, increased energy intake. I'll talk about that a little bit more in a bit. Okay. Uh, the last group I'll talk about just briefly are the Chimani. And again, probably many of you are familiar with the Chimani. They're an uh, industrial, uh, sorry, uh, an Amazonian river basin group as well, uh, foragers and farmers. Uh, and, and they fish a lot as well. This is work done with Michael Gervin and Hilly Kaplan and their group. Um, and I'm showing you just, instead of showing it as a plot of expenditure against body size here, I'm just showing you the body size corrected, expended, uh, body size corrected data. And I'm starting you off here with accelerometry measured physical activity. So this is minutes a day of activity in male and female cohorts in the Haza and Shimani, as well as um, six, sorry, seven other populations. Uh, with similar measurements of activity. And I've rank ordered the uh, populations, the industrialized populations by activity level here. Now, if it were true that uh, the activity level of your lifestyle just you know, corresponded directly to how much energy you expend, then if I show you total daily energy expenditures here for these groups, then I, it should basically be the same graph, but just with different units. Instead of minutes a day of activity, it should be uh, calories a day of energy expenditure. But when I do that, if I show you uh, body size adjusted energy expenditures, here's what they look like, okay? There's no correspondence between total daily energy expenditure uh, and activity level for any of these groups. And in fact, even if you don't like the data from my lab for some reason, you don't wanna pay attention to the Hodge and Shimani data, that's fine. Uh, just look at the gray data. These are all published values of activity and published values of expenditure, and there's no correspondence. Populations that have high activity levels do not expend more energy every day than populations that have low energy expenditure, low activity levels. And by the way, it's not just humans. Um, if we look at populations of other of, of non-human primates, I showed you this graph before, but there's one thing I didn't point out. Here's total energy expenditure against body mass again. Primates are low, but what I didn't tell you is that some of those cohort, cohorts of primates are from captive populations like zoos. And some are measured in wild populations. And you can see that the wild and the zoo populations cluster around their regression line for primates in a similar way. There, there's actually no difference um, statistically between captive primates and wild primates total energy expenditures. So it's not just humans. Um, lifestyle has very little effect on total energy expenditure for other primates as well. And in fact, you can do this um, in an experimental setting. So you can do exercise intervention studies with humans. So uh, this is women and men trained to run a half marathon over the course of a year. So here's this black line here tracks their total energy ex 
total energy expenditure every couple of months over the course of a year as they train more and more and more training per week uh, to, to race a half marathon. You can do this with uh, lab rodents. You can do this with birds in captivity. You can change their daily activities so they have to work harder and harder for their food. And notice in the black lines, right? There's never any difference. Sorry, I didn't mean that to pop up right away, but let me show you this first. In yellow, uh, there's, there's hardly any difference. And in fact, often no difference in total energy expenditure against activity. So as you make somebody more and more active, they actually don't burn more and more energy. Their bodies are compensating. Um, this popped up early, but I wanna walk through it. This is a nice study done um, after I wrote this review. Uh, Kevin Hall's group at NIH did a similar study. They had mice um, without access to a running wheel for a week, and they measured their energy expenditure in blue. And then they give the mice access to a running wheel, and the mice run more and more and more, thousands of revolutions a day, uh, running every, more and more every week. And total energy expenditure has this funny blip in the beginning. It's, uh, it'd be interesting to know what that adjustment is, but then is flat and doesn't change anymore, even as they get more and more and more physically active. So uh, kind of no matter how you look at it, either epidemiologically across populations or even within individuals in intervention studies, total energy expenditure does not correspond to daily activity. Instead, uh, the, our work is suggesting something like this, that metabolism is actually dynamic and it adjusts to keep energy expenditure in check. So here's how I think about it. Uh, imagine two people here that are both pretty sedentary and their daily energy expenditure looks something like this. Some amount spent on, acti on activity and a lot of it is spent on other stuff. Uh, maintenance, housekeeping kind of tasks that your body has to do every day. Um, person on the right decides to change their lifestyle, which is a smart thing to do and get more active. And so they start to exercise more. And for a while, their total energy expenditure does go up, right? Because they're spending more energy on activity and everything, uh, it, it sort of lifts the whole total energy expenditure for, for that person. Um, but then eventually their body adjusts and uh, compensates by cutting out energy spent on other tasks to keep energy expenditure at the end of the day, pretty similar to where it was, sometimes even indistinguishable from where it was, before people started exercising. Um, now, that can be disappointing. It can make it hard to lose weight, perhaps. We are looking into that uh, implication in, in work that we're doing right now. Um, but it actually, the, the adjustments made here by the body to respond to activity level changes are probably really good for us. So what's getting cut out when your body reduces the other expenditure um, seem to be things like inflammation, stress reactivity, uh, perhaps even moderation of, of reproductive hormones, and these changes are probably quite good for us. In fact, we, we know these changes are good for us from epidemiological work and other studies. So for example, um, if we look at this work from the NHANES data set, this is the National Health and Nutrition and Exercise Survey um, done in the US every couple of years. And this is over 3,600 people. And if you ask them if they exercise not very much every week, every month or four to 20 times a month or over 20 times a month, the level of inflammation the level, of, sorry, the number of people, the percentage of people with elevated uh, inflammation levels goes down, down, down as you exercise more and more. So inflammation is being cut out, uh, perhaps as a, uh, you know, a, a, an expense, a metabolic expense that your body can afford to cut out as you get more and more physically active. Uh, reproductive hormones seem to be lower as well. And so here's data from a, a paper by Anthony Hackney uh, and Lane done looking at testosterone levels in men. And this is cross-sectional. So this is men who do not train at all, uh, men who have been running, distance running for a year, distance running for two years, five years, 10 years, or 15 years. And as you can see that compared to sedentary controls, men who have been exercising for one year, this is endurance running, I should say, distance running, have 10% lower testosterone levels. But the other thing I wanna point out is how long it seems to take for the body to fully adjust because the body doesn't completely hit the sort of plateau level of adjustment until five or so years of expenditure. And here's where I think uh, work with hunting and gathering and other subsistence groups can really be important for understanding the effects of physical activity. Um, you know, in the clinical world, in the NIH world, getting a study that's one or two years long to follow people for you know, 12 to, to 24 months would be considered a really long-term study. But if the body takes longer than that to adjust, right, then, then we really need these kind of epidemiological studies to understand what those long-term adjustments look like. And in fact, if you look at testosterone levels 
in men in subsistence economies, including the Hadza. Uh, they actually look like men who've been endurance training for five or more years. Um, this change in reproductive hormones, I want to stress, doesn't mean that you will have any fertility issues. In fact, it, it might be better for your reproductive system. Um, but in any case, it does seem to be related to the reduction in uh, reproductive cancer risk that we see in people who are physically active. Um, and the last thing I'll talk about here is that stress reactivity seems to go down. So this is a, a within subject study. Uh, women who had mild depressive symptoms were either, uh, it's, it's a crossover study. So in part of the study, they were got a therapy, talk therapy. In part of the study, they got talk therapy plus 30 minutes of jogging five days a week. And they measured 24 hour production of cortisol and epinephrine in the urine in both arms of the study. And during the active phase of the study, um, cortisol levels and epinephrine levels went down 30%. So stress reactivity seems to also decrease when you're physically active. So these metabolic adjustments are probably, we think, an important reason that exercise is so good for you. And I wanna stress that I'm not arguing that it's anything other than really good for you. Um, these changes in how our bodies burn energy might kind of frustrate our attempts to lose weight with exercise, but they, again, they're probably a reason that exercise is so important and so good for us. Um, and in fact, uh, exercise can also aid in weight loss maintenance and maintain lean mass uh, while you're exercise, uh, losing weight. So there are all other reasons to exercise as well. But it does also suggest, um, it does point to diet then as the main driver for the modern obesity pandemic, because if energy expenditures aren't changing with lifestyle, then that must be something about the energy that's coming in that's uh, affecting us. I just want to quickly, in, in a talk about expenditures, I want to talk about energy intakes for just a, a brief moment here. Again, I think it's uh, important to talk about, but also a nice opportunity to, to highlight some more of Frank's influence. Um, if we look at traditional diets, of course, there's a whole lot of um, you know, books out there and arguments out there about what human diets looked like in the past and what the sort of you know, natural human diet is or the, the paleo diet is for humans. Um, and I would just want to point out, this is uh, an analysis that I did with, with Brian last year, uh, that there is no paleo diet. And in fact, there is no um, singular human ancestral diet at all. And that human diets have been and are and, and, and always have been incredibly diverse over time and across uh, different populations. So here is uh, cumul accumulated data uh, days of observation, in fact, years of observation for the Hadza population. Uh, this goes back to the 80s and all the way up till today. And this is how much meat is in the diet. And you can see that different periods of time, there's different amounts of meat in the diet. And it accounts for different amounts of, of energy uh, eaten every day. And so you can imagine how impossible it would be then to understand or try to, to recreate a single human diet, given how variable, even within this one population, the amount of meat is in the diet. And we can focus in on work that, that Frank led with Colette Burbesque here. This sort of section is, is based on Frank's work. Uh, and so that, let's look at that. We, Frank did a, a really careful uh, series of measurements of not just meat brought back to camp, but also the other foods too. And we can use that to, to put together a Hadza diet over the course of a year. And just look how variable it is. Um, first of all, there's a lot of honey, as Frank has pointed out in a lot of his, his later work. Um, but the amount of honey is quite variable. The amount of meat is quite variable, right? There's no singular Hadza diet, much less any singular hunter-gatherer or paleo diet. And uh, Frank's insights here are really key to understanding just how variable and adaptable human diets are. Of course, we're not just variable within a species, sorry, within a population over time. Uh, human diets are also quite variable across space. Here's 260 traditional populations against uh, where they live on, on the planet, how close they are to the equator here, zero or away from the planet towards the poles, away from the equator towards the poles. And this is how much of the diet comes from animals. And you can see that places that are colder, they eat fewer plants and more animals. That's not a surprise because that's, that's what grows in these cold climates. Uh, but culture has a big impact as well. And cultures that uh, depend more on fishing or on pastoralism, eat more meat, uh, diets that have integrated a bit more farming, uh, none of these populations do much farming or much pastoralism, but the ones that do a little bit of farming eat more plants. The ones that do a little bit of pastoralism eat more meat. Um, and so there's an enormous amount of geographic variation across diets and across populations. 
So what has gotten us into trouble then? If it's not just, you know, people like to, to blame carbohydrates or blame, you know, super villain kind of diet elements. Um, I think if you had to point your finger to one thing in our diet that's so dangerous for obesity, uh, it's the ultra processed foods and, and how easy it is to get cheap calories. Um, this is the energy density calories per gram. And this is how much uh, the energy costs. And this is work done by Drunowski. And you can see that when you go to a modern supermarket, these are all data from a modern supermarket in the US, um, the foods that are the easiest to afford are also the most energy dense. Things like mayonnaise and baked goods and cookies, right? So our diet has gone through a lot of changes over the past oh, 12,000 years, but nothing bigger than industrialization um, and the advent of these cheap industrialized engineered foods. If you look at Hadza foods, right? Most Hadza foods cluster here, kind of in, in the, the center of this energy density plot. Uh, there are no Hadza foods that are this energy dense. Um, honey, this is honey right here. It's about as energy dense as a Hadza food gets, um, but nothing is the, matches the kind of um, engineered marvels that we fill our supermarkets with. And so we probably shouldn't be surprised if our modern brains, uh, sorry, our, our, our um, evolved brains are overwhelmed by these modern marbles. Um, if we look at, again, hunter-gatherer diets or diets from the Chimani or the Schwar, uh, they actually have a fair bit of carbohydrate in them. I point this out because a lot of people have, have argued in this sort of paleo diet reconstruction that you see around today, that paleo diets were high fat, low carb. There's actually no evidence for that at all um, in any of these uh, subsistence economy uh, diets. They do have a lot of fiber, so perhaps that's something that we could focus on if we want to make our diets healthier. But I think um, if we just avoid ultra processed foods, that would be a good start. And by doing that, we'd end up eating more fiber anyway. Anyway, uh, I just wanted to touch on the diet piece of it since I think it's so important and uh, highlight Frank's contribution there as well. But you know, in terms of how energy expenditure changes with lifestyle, well, not much, right? Because energy, our bodies compensate. And because of that, activity doesn't lead to increased expenditure in the way that we'd expect. Um, and you know, we, we can't blame the obesity epidemic on uh, a change in uh, physical activity or a change in energy expenditure. In fact, I think we have to, to blame the obesity epidemic on our diets. And if I had to pick one thing, I, I would pick ultra processed foods, although surely it's, it's multifactorial and there's a lot of things that contribute, but ultra processed foods, I think, would argue, or, or if you had to pick one big factor would, would be it for me. Okay, so um, I wanna finish up then by talking about how energy expenditure changes as we age. And I'll be quick with this. I know we're getting close to the, the usual end time for, for a speaker. Uh, so I'll, I'll be relatively quick, but I wanted to talk about this uh, exciting stuff that's, that's come out of this project, um, the Global Doubly Labeled Water Database. And, and this is a resource now that we have developed. Uh, my lab, which does this doubly labeled water work, as well as other labs across the globe that do this kind of work. Um, we've all pitched in, put our data together. And because of that, we have a pretty large data set now, over 7,000 measurements um, for individuals from eight years old up through into their 90s uh, to understand how energy expenditure changes across populations, um, across different parts of the life cycle, um, and with any other uh, variables or inputs that you would, would like to investigate. And so please, if you're interested in these kind of questions, um, I suggest you check out this website or contact one of us who, who run the, the database. Um, it's a freely available uh, resource for everyone to use if you're interested in uh, questions of energy expenditure. Um, this has come together over the past few years. And just in this last summer, uh, we've had a couple of uh, the first papers from this effort come out including this one uh, that I had a chance to lead, looking at daily energy expenditure over the human life course. And uh, I wanna walk through the results from that because I think they're, they're also informative in thinking about humans and human life history and you know, human adaptation and health. Uh, Herman, I just thought I'd interject. Yeah. Feel free to take as much time as you need. The time constraint isn't really a hard and fast rule. So okay. you know, don't, don't feel like you're up against you know, a hard limit here. No problem, I appreciate that. I, I, I'll wrap it up anyhow, but uh, I, I do appreciate that. Thank you. Um, so first of all, just some sort of basic stuff that I think are, is useful to remind ourselves. Um, this is fat-free mass again against total energy expenditure and fat-free mass is by far the strongest predictor of energy expenditure um, 
both basal metabolic rates, but also total energy expenditures in humans and other primates. And you can see this kind of power law relationship between total energy expenditure and fat-free mass. Um, you can see total energy expenditure here across the, the, uh, the lifespan as well here. This is, this is just total energy expenditure, megajoules per day. Um, a couple of things to point out. One, because this is a curvilinear relationship, this is a power law relationship, um, anybody who's taking the simple ratio of energy expenditure to body size is, it, you're doing it wrong. I'm sorry to tell you. Um, if you have a curvilinear relationship like this, uh, you can't just take the ratio of, of, you know, of this variable to that variable, regardless of what the variables are. You can't take the, the ratio of energy expenditure to, to mass because that ratio inherently will change um, over the, you know, the, the, the spectrum of your x-axis. Um, and so we have to use regression-based approaches to understand if, if individuals are above or below where we'd expect them to be. Uh, notice too that we do see some really kind of strange clumping happening here. Um, individuals who are juveniles, and here we define that as anybody uh, one to 20 years old. I'll show you why we define it that way in a second. They're all cluster above the line, right? Whereas adults seem to cluster right on the line and, and so do infants. Okay. We can take these age cohorts and we can kind of uh, track them on that, on this panel here. And this is, this is what this looks like to kind of get an idea for the trajectory of energy expenditure over the lifespan. So as you grow, older, you also grow bigger, and your energy expenditure goes up in this curvilinear manner. And eventually you hit this adult level where you're burning energy happily as an adult. And then eventually older adults tend to lose lean mass. Uh, and they also tend to have a lower metabolic rate for that lean mass here. So you see sort of a, the, the, the downside of the slope, the down, you know, when you're at a certain age, you sort of start coming down in terms of your metabolic rate. Um, and so to, to get a better idea of that and uh, understand this more carefully, um, we did this. So here, rather than looking at this in, in raw terms, I've log transformed, a natural log transformed fat-free mass against um, TEE. And you can see there are sort of three discrete phases here. And I use this adult regression of total energy expenditure, well, log total energy expenditure against log fat-free mass, use this regression to um, calculate an adjusted energy expenditure for every individual in the, in the data set. And so I used adults 20 to 60 years old. And um, I, again, I use this regression to calculate basically a residual if you're above or below the line here for adults. And that allows us to ask the question, any of these individuals here, do they have a higher or lower energy expenditure than we would expect for their body size and their body composition? And I should say that it's not just fat-free mass that we use to calculate these regressions. Um, fat-free mass was the strongest uh, covariate here for sure, but we also use fat, free, fat mass as well. Um, and sex wasn't an important, it wasn't a significant factor, so we didn't use that for this. Okay, so here's this then. Here's adjusted total energy expenditure. Um, if you have a hundred adjusted expenditure, that means you're exactly, you're, you're exactly what we'd expect for an adult um, of your size, okay? So 100 is 100% of the expected adult expenditures. And here it is against age. And we see a really distinct kind of roadmap of where energy expenditure goes over the human lifespan. And so there are these four uh, phases that we can identify. First of all, you're born with a metabolic rate that looks like an adult kind of strange actually, because small animals typically have really fast metabolisms for their size, but the smallest humans don't. Newborns have energy expenditures of metabolic rates that look like tiny adults, um, which kind of makes sense because you're gestating as part of mom. Um, but nonetheless, it was a surprise to us because we thought they'd have elevated expenditures. They don't. But over that first year of life, your metabolic rate adjusted for your body size um, elevates by 50% an enormous increase in metabolic rate so that you have this metabolic rate at one year old that's 50% higher than we'd expect for your body size. The second phase of life than this juvenile phase is from about one to 20 years uh, of age where energy expenditures just slowly decline. Males decline slower, which may be because males mature more slowly. Uh, we're not sure about that. Uh, but in any case, males uh, decline slower, which is why they say above the female cohorts here as you track out. Uh, 
there's no change of puberty. We expected to see a big change of puberty, but we don't. And so that was a surprise. And then from 20 to 60 years old, there is no change in metabolic rate. It is steady as anything you could, you could imagine. Um, no change in size adjusted expenditures from 20 years old to 60 years old. No change with menopause and no kind of slowdown at your 30s or 40s, which as someone in my 40s, I found surprising, but is nonetheless clear from the data. Around 60 years old, something changes and uh, metabolic rates decline at about 7% per decade. And that's even after we adjust for the fact that people in this uh, part of the life course are also losing uh, muscle mass typically. But even after you correct for that, you still see on top of that loss of muscle mass and, and associated expenditures, you see in, uh, an, uh, decrease in metabolic rate as well. So their cells are less and less active. And so by the time you are in your 90s, your cells are about 20 to 25% less active than they were when you were in your 50s. Whether that's related to increases, uh, increased risk of disease uh, for people in this part of their life uh, is something that we'd love to understand and, and, and find out more about. I'll also point out that we see the same pattern in basal metabolic rates, right? So this is, is, this is not a, an effect of activity levels changing, right? Um, we actually see the same thing happening with basal metabolic rate. So something is happening with the cells and the cells are following a very carefully choreographed set of changes over the lifespan, spending a lot of energy on development and growth uh, here in the early part of the life. Uh, and then that ends up declining in the later part of life. We'd love to understand all of these changes um, going forward. Interestingly, not only was energy expenditure stable from age 20 to 60, it's even stable during pregnancy. And so uh, when, you know, if, you, if we look at pre-pregnancy versus first, second, and third trimester, of course, energy expenditure is going up as mothers gain weight. But even after you account for that weight change, uh, you see that the adjusted expenditure the, is, is, is the same. So in other words, expenditures do increase through pregnancy, but that's only because of increases in weight and fat-free mass. Um, there's no change in how busy the cells are as you go through pregnancy. Last thing I'll mention is uh, other work from this doubly labeled water database, again, suggesting, which I talked about in the middle part of this court, the, 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 the talk, uh, looking at activity levels and energy expenditure, that people who are more physically active uh, have experienced trade-offs where if your energy, your activity expenditure is higher, right? your basal energy expenditure um, tends to be lower. Uh, so that people who have um, high, basal, uh, high activity energy expenditures tend to have lower basal expenditures. This is between subjects. Um, the amount of compensation you see is between 28 and 49%. So in other words, if you are exercising 100 more calories a day, you'd only see maybe 60 calories a day increased on your total energy expenditure. Um, and that's between subjects. And actually, if you look at it within subjects in people who've been measured at two time points, um, the compensation is actually closer to about 100%. So just more supportive data for this idea that the body is adaptable and adapts to lifestyle um, from this doubly labeled water database effort. Okay, so how does energy expenditure change as we age? Well, there's four stages and we are now uh, stuck with <laughs> trying to understand what those stages are all about. Um, kind of unpack that and figure out what, what features change and, and why and, and how and how that affects things like development, growth, reproduction, and health through the human lifespan. Okay. So with that, I want to say thank you to everyone for listening. Um, special thanks to Frank. I really am honored to be uh, able to give a Frank Marlowe Memorial Lecture. I would rather that I was able to <laughs> Uh, call him up or send him an email and uh, find out what he thought about some of this stuff. Um, I'm sure he'd have a lot of, of interesting things to say, um, but uh, I'm, I'm honored to be able to, to speak at this uh, memorial lecture for him. Um, I want to point out the Hadza Fund, which is a, a charity that we've started with Brian and, um, and, and Dave Reichland and uh, a few others to try to give back to the Hadza community. And so if you're interested in the Hadza or any of our work, you could also, or, or maybe perhaps in helping them uh, remain a vibrant community. You can check them out at hazafund.org. And of course, I want to thank all my collaborators and funders. And um, I would be remiss if I didn't point out that you can find some of this material, as Brian mentioned, in my book, Burn, 
um, which covers the HADSA work, the energy compensation work, and some other stuff that we've learned along the way. So I hope there's time for questions and thank you. Thank you so much, Herman. I really appreciate you uh, giving us this great overview of, uh, of work spanning so many different labs, field sites, uh, even really paradigms, uh, synthesizing both a kind of evolutionary public health and exercise physiology uh, approach to these issues. So really, thank, thanks for doing that. And as, um, as, as a moderator now for a, uh, some q and I would love if anyone would care to raise their hand uh, in chat who might have a question for, uh, for Herman. I'll be writing down your names and doing my best uh, to keep track of who would be next. So uh, the first person I see is Brooke. Brooke, go ahead and, uh, and ask your question, please. Hey Herman, thanks so much. Um, this was so interesting. I've been following along, I feel like more as a lay person reading the New York Times articles on all of your work and things over the last years. Um, it's it's super fascinating. It was really fun to see it all come together um, in the talk today. So I have sort of a specific question about one of the last um, findings that you showed about there not being any changes in um, women who are pregnant and breastfeeding. And I'm just wondering if you how how you sort of square that with the work of people like Claudia Valigia and, and Peter Ellison about fecundity being affected by energy balance? And like, do you think that that doesn't make as much sense as, as they claim? Because it seemed like that was the biggest factor yeah. um, in bringing your body sort of back online. No, so the way I would reconcile those two observations is that... Uh, it's a great question, by the way. Thank you for that. But the, the way I'd reconcile that is that we're seeing kind of a more or less set rate of energy expenditure that your cells are, are you know, are geared to do. Um, and it's really hard to change that. Um, and what that means is that you have to meet that energy expenditure with energy intake. And if you don't, you're going to be in um, negative energy balance. And as they've shown, that's really critical, right? So the body, basically, you could imagine that you could uh, kind of manage, you know, uh, uncertainty in resources or uncertainty in your, your environment by either managing how much energy you're spending or how much energy you're sort of working to make sure you get food to, to bring in. Um, and that if you can't make ends meet, that you, you don't do something really expensive like reproduction. Uh, and so I think this is saying, look, your body actually can't change energy expenditure very well, unless, I mean, it can, it can put the brakes on metabolic rate um, if you're, if you are starving, but you're also then not going to be in a position to reproduce either. So, you know, even if you are able to, to maintain that, that sort of normal metabolic rate, if you're not able to make ends meet and bring energy in at that same rate, you're in negative energy balance. There are signals for that. And your body should say, stop, basically no more reproduction for you. Um, and I think that's, we're starting, this helps kind of unpack what those mechanisms look like and how that sort of feedback would look like. Thanks, Brooke. Thanks, Herman. Uh, our next question, uh, Dan. Thanks, Herman. Really fascinating stuff and, and very clearly presented. Um, uh, I have a couple of questions um, unrelated to one another. So um, the first is uh, going back toward the beginning of the, of the talk, um, the elevated energy level relative to a mammal of our expected size for primates across the board. Um, I, I'm curious how uh, you see that fitting with, uh, without necessarily endorsing, but how you see it fitting with the expensive tissue hypothesis mm -hmm. where, um, you know, the, the argument that, you know, our rich diet, which enables an inexpensive gut, um, compensates for our very expensive brains. Is it, is it that we'd be you know, off that regression line entirely if, um, if we didn't have you know, short guts um, or, or is there some other explanation there? Yeah, so I see those as working together. Thank you for that question. So you know, all primates are low metabolic rate compared to other mammals and we're low too. Um, so humans burn 2,500 kilocalories a day, for example, a typical human. But a mammal our size, you'd expect, and we actually have measurements of this, would burn 5,000 kilocalories a day. That'd be typical for a mammal our size. So we're really low, but then within the apes, we're high. So sort of you zoom into the level of the analysis of the apes, we're high. Um, and we're high, it, it actually makes, it, it helps 
clear up a problem that the expensive tissue hypothesis approach has. Um, expensive tissue hypothesis made the really important observation that you have these trade-offs for brains and guts, but what it can't explain is everything else. So you can kind of account for brains and gut size differences with ex expensive tissue hypothesis trade-offs, but humans don't just have bigger brains, we have bigger babies, we have babies more often, we have more physically active lifestyles, we have longer lifespans, which probably it's unclear, but would probably require energy for maintenance that other apes aren't doing as much of. And so there's all these things that humans are doing that are really energy expensive. Um, and expensive tissue hypothesis kind of can't get you all the way there. So I think that that's, um, you end up sort of rescuing that hypothesis with the observation that, oh, you don't have to get all the way there with trade-offs. You can get there with tra some trade-offs and with also this sort of sea change in energy expenditure. Okay. Yeah, that makes sense. Thank you. So yeah. um, speaking of maintenance, that segues into my second question, which is, you know, um, uh, to, to simplify a, a rich presentation, um, uh, I, you know, perhaps one could boil down your take home messages as, as energy expended through activity and, um, uh, and energy that is just keeping the machine running the basal metabolic rate are dynamic such that the higher the former, the lower the latter. Um, all else being equal, you would think that in the environment of evolutionary adaptedness, the, the basal metabolic rate is doing a lot of good, right? That is that yeah. um, uh, this, is, this is maintenance. There's all kinds of repair and, and, and you know, infection um, combating and so on, right? Um, which raises the question why ac increasing activity levels are so health promoting in situations of evolutionary yeah. disequilibrium. And is it the case that, you know, well, everything's out of whack. And so uh, the luxury of, you know, living in the, um, the Wally world where the machines do all the work and, you know, and, and we don't have to expend any energy um, doesn't actually allow us to do a whole lot more maintenance and repair because there aren't enough pathogens for us to be fighting. And so that system goes out of whack or what is it? Because all else being equal, you would expect that, you know, having the luxury of, of raising that yeah. Um, BMR line would result in greater, not lesser health. Yeah, well, so there's a few things to think about with that. Um, I agree completely. And so I think it's, it's, uh, it's unclear exactly why it is that, you know, the exercise is so beneficial and why it's bad to have these high resting metabolic rate levels. Um, two things. First of all, I think that the kinds of things our body spends energy on when you have the luxury of extra energy are things perhaps like uh, inflammation, stress response, reproductive hormone levels that, you know, if, if they're done periodically over the course of a lifespan spent, you know, in a hunting and gathering society where you didn't have luxury for very much, very often, but happened sometimes you could take advantage of it by clearing up an infection or by, you know, reproducing now when the, the time is right. Um, you know, the sort of luxury expenditures there could be strong selection to do those when you're sensing that it's a good time to do them. But now it's always a good time to do them. So we always have an overactive immune system and we always have sky high reproductive hormone levels and we always um, react to stress to stressful situations too, too strongly. So it could be a kind of, um, you know, the, the, the response is adaptive but the environment now makes it maladaptive because it's, it's a response that was only meant to be able, that, that evolved in a situation where you can only do it every now and then. That's um, a that's a cogent response. Um, wouldn't that suggest? And I don't know whether the the data that you and your many collaborators have can address this, but that there'd be some kind of an inflection point, right? That there'd yeah. be wh where is the where is the boundary of disequilibrium, right? Where you're beyond what the system is designed. There's there's too much luxury, as it were, right? Yeah. So that's really fun, actually. So if you look at the epidemiological work and you look at um, uh, activity levels versus health right? So it's always, well, always, it depends on the study, but it's, it's very often a J-shaped curve, I guess, if that's the right shape, where you get the biggest health benefits from exercise by going from zero to something. And once you get above sort of moderate levels of exercise, actually, you don't get a huge payoff. You get maybe mod, you know, minimal negligible increases in, in health beyond that, that sort of moderate level. And actually, if you push it too far, 
right? If you exercise too much, now you're not just cutting out the luxury items. Now you're cutting out the stuff you really need and health can actually suffer. So you can get overtraining syndrome. So, um, you know, so overtraining syndrome that athletes deal with a lot is reduced, uh, reduced immune uh, function, right? They don't, res they don't heal. They don't uh, get over colds and, and other infections very well. Um, men and women see, you know, really, really reduced uh, reproductive hormone levels, women often stop cycling, men you know, re report really reduced libido. Um, and so, yeah, so you, you can actually push the system too far, but there's a pretty wide range there where you're all in, it's all a pretty healthy place to be. Super sedentary is really bad for you. Elite athletes are, could, can, could be in trouble. And there's a lot of, of space in the middle. Got it. Thanks. Yeah. Uh, Herman, I have a question for you. Mm -hmm. um, so kind of following up on some, some of Dan's points about, you know, where you are on a spectrum, let's say, let's call it uh, energetic limitation, perhaps. Um, and, and, you know, certainly the industrialized world is in a disequilibrium in the sense that, you know, we're, we're at a point where reducing uh, our energy intake and increasing our uh, physical activity is going to be probably getting us a little bit closer to more health promoting um, lifestyle. Mm -hmm. But I'm also thinking about the, the other side of the, of the spectrum, you can call it, wherein you can imagine, um, you know, there's many different theories about how diet changed in human evolution, uh, focusing on the impacts that higher quality diets would have uh, upon well, many things, um, and it's usually addressed as like a, a, an entire package of things. It's not just uh, higher quality foods, but it's also changes in social organization, changes in technology, lot, like a, a whole package uh, what, that defines the human uh, foraging niche. But I'm, I'm wondering if for the sake of just, you know, uh, discussion, we put aside the issues of uh, the, the other standalone impacts that would, that would come from having different kinds of tools and a different sort of social organization. And we just drill down into the relationship, for example, between um, going from a, a highly, um, you know, uh, typical, more typical primate diet um, and energy scarcity to one in which we, we, we have greater access to calories um, through either certain kinds of favorable environments or uh, new kinds of foraging niches that are able to be exploited. What would your thinking about the impacts of sort of opening up the, the full TEE budget um, through greater access to food calories have on allocations, um, let's say to, to, uh, yeah. to, to immunity or other effects that it would have on maintenance and possibly longevity? Um, so the relationship, I wonder if you could talk about the relationship between yeah. energy availability and lifespan um, and ecological variation there. Yeah, I, I, um, that's a really great set of questions. I, I don't know exactly how to, to focus the answer, but um, I, I, as I understand the, you know, the mortality curves, for example, if we look at, um, you know, the work that like, uh, Mike Gervin and Hillary Kaplan have done looking at, at mortality curves over, over, you know, mortality risk per year from age zero to age 80 or 90. And you can see different curves. You can put different mortality curves together for people in industrialized populations, you know, high or low economic status, industrialized populations or subsistence populations or hunter gatherer populations. Um, as I understand it, even after you factor out uh, things like um, you know, disease, uh, infectious disease in, in subsistence groups, you still have, you know, kind of, you can sort of factor those out of the analysis and see, well, what would the mortality curves be like, even if you didn't have that rate of death from infectious disease, the rates are still higher, uh, mortality rates are still higher, um, especially at the end of life, sixth and seventh and, and eighth decade, than they are in industrialized populations that have a lot of energy availability. Mm -hmm. And so my suggestion would be that there's a lot of maintenance going on that actually helps extend lifespans in a society like ours that we don't have a good handle on, we don't have great biomarkers for, but nonetheless are making it possible to be, you know, 
a hale and hearty 85 year old, 90 year old, and more likely to be that person than you are in a, you know, in a, in a subsistence economy where energy is tighter. And so less maintenance is happening or if the maintenance is happening, it's happening on acute threats right now from pathogens rather than the kind of upkeep that you could do to tell yourself from senescing. Um, so I don't know that that's the answer, but that would be my guess. I mean, one thing we'd love to know is all that variation. I showed you those adjusted exp expenditures across the lifespan. And there's a lot of variation around there. Mm -hmm. Some people are high, some people are low for their age. And we'd love to know, are those people aging differently? What are they spending those extra calories on? And that might help um, kind of unpack a lot of, of what you're talking about there. I don't know is a short answer. Those are my hand wavy guesses. Okay, thanks. Similar to the, to the cultural and technological differences, could climate or latitudes have any impact here, particularly on the metabolism? I mean, we know higher- Yeah, so we don't see, so you, you know, you'd expect the people with, you know, in cold environments, for example, would burn more calories to stay warm. Um, I can tell you that we have an analysis of that coming out of the double labeled water database, and we don't see that. It looks like at least in the people who we've been able to sample in this, in this uh, you know, in, in that 7,000 people across 29 countries, um, most of them are from industrialized, you know, economies. Um, the HODs are in there, but, you know, the HODs are the exceptions. Most of them are Americans or, or Europeans. Um, we don't see an effect of, of temperature there, um, at least nothing, you know. And when you're controlling not, for body mass? Yeah, yeah, okay. even after that. Okay. Uh, and so, um, so, yeah, it seems like people are, you know, humans have figured out how to, uh, buffer all of that culturally. Um, so you would expect to see an effect, but you don't. So that suggests we're doing a really good job buffering culturally. Thank you. Yeah. Um, does anyone else have a question? Cause I, I could continue to ask Herman another question if, if, uh, Sean, is that a clap or is that a, uh, oh, sorry, that was a hand up. <laughs> okay, good. Yeah. Um, I was interested in the, energy compensation results, which are sort of depressing, but um, yeah. it seemed like there was a lot of variability in that scatter plot. I was wondering if one, if you know what determines differences in energy compensation and two, is this a human only phenomenon or is this something that we see in other species as well? Yeah, so the, the second question is easier. We definitely see this in other animals. Um, so I'm getting, the sun has shifted and I'm getting, uh, getting blown out. That's slightly better. Um, so the, yeah, so it definitely happens in other animals too. And in fact, it's the easiest to see this in rodents, for example, you can get them exercising more and more and more and their energy expenditure doesn't change. So, uh, it's really clear there. Um, we don't know among humans who's more likely to respond than others. We don't know why that happens. We have, uh, some grants in right now to ask that question and try to figure that out. Um, but yeah, I don't, I don't know. Um, in the paper that I referenced at the end, the current biology paper, people who had higher BMIs compensated more, which would be kind of, that's sort of, you know, a, a cruel twist of fate. If you're trying to use exercise as a way to, you know, to, to increase your energy expenditure and not be in positive energy balance, and you're compensating more, people who have high BMI are compensating more. Now it's cross-sectional. We don't know if the arrow goes one way or the other, or if there's some third or fourth or whatever factor that just, it happens to be along for the ride with BMI and or BMI is along for the ride with that more important factor. We don't know, it's a, you know, it's a cross-sectional study. Um, but yeah, so that's the one thing that seems to come out, but we don't know functionally what that's about. So Herman, I, I, I like the way that you described our earlier work with the Hadza where we went out there essentially to say, well, it's unquestionably the case that TE is going to be higher. The question was how much more. Right. And I and I'm reflecting upon what the data data showed us. I remember thinking how easy it is to form these impressions about what kinds of data you anticipate based on your own personal biases. My personal bias being when I follow a, a, a Hadza individual all day on the landscape, I feel completely beat. You know, and I'm basing things on that sub level of subjective cognition, really. Uh, feeds into my expectations about, you know, metabolism writ large. And clearly those are not the same systems. And we have all sorts of interesting cognitive adaptations, which are, you know, coupled with the underlying physiology, physiology of metabolism and energy allocation. 
And I'm just wondering, um, like you just like you just mentioned, uh, the the cruel twist of fate that individuals with higher BMI might have greater um, uh, energy compensation. And and if, is there is there work in this sphere about how you know the psychology, uh, the sort of affective uh, sense, uh, the affective sense of, of feeling uh, and perceiving energy use or physical activity, how different yeah. aspects of human cognition can also be thought of from an evolutionary standpoint um, mm. as, as a part of a, like a, a systemic evolved complex. That sounds like a question for Dan. Well, that's, uh, we do have a lot of good psychology uh, yeah. expertise uh, in here. And so that's why, yeah. That's well, why let, me, let me embarrass myself. Myself. Yeah. And let me embarrass myself and give you an answer that probably that can be can be dismissed immediately. Um, that I think it's really interesting that we're terrible at figuring out how many calories things cost. Yeah, it's such an incredibly important um, variable, right? And because it's where the rubber hits the road. You know, if you if you want to grow, if you want to reproduce, if you want to move, you need to bring calories, and it really comes down to that. And so you would think that you'd be really good at telling how many calories you're bringing in or spending. Um, and somehow we are quite good at that at one level. Think about this, even in a society where people are gaining a couple pounds a year, that's America, um, and we think that we're out of energy balance all the time and gaining weight, which we kind of are on average, you're still doing an incredible job every day matching energy intake and expenditure. So even the typical American who gains two or three pounds a year is matching energy intake and expenditure to within less than a, you know, a tiny fraction of a percentage of expenditure on average per day. So your body's exceedingly good at that mm -hmm. in general. But cognitively, what you're aware of, we're terrible at it. Because if I ask you to rate energy expended on different, you know, on, on different uh, tasks, or if I ask you to, to tell me, do you think you're a high metabolism person or a slow metabolism person? You can't tell me. Um, I think that's interesting. And I, and I think that that means that the subjective experience of activity and fatigue, and it, it can't be about energy balance. It has to be about things like not injuring yourself, um, knowing when to give up on a resource and switch to a different resource, right? Being economical about that kind of thing, rather than being economical and sort of on a broad scale about, uh, about calories even as important as a calorie, I, I th yeah. So I think there's a funny paradox there um, that people don't actually know how many calories they burn, even though it's important, but they do seem to think they know how many calories they burn and they're wrong. And I don't know what to do about that. Dan, the, the ball's in your hand now. Uh, well, I wasn't really raising my hand to answer your question, okay. Ryan, although, I, I mean, I will, I will point out that, um, uh, I mean, that it seems like the conscious components of appetite are not entirely tied to satiation, right? That people will eat when they're not hungry, they'll eat beyond the point of satiation, right? And, and, and- um, I'll just say, just interject there, particularly with ultra processed foods, that's yeah. why they're so dangerous, yeah. is the hedonic response and the satiety uh, hunger management, which actually is typically quite good, is, that you're literally engineered, like, you know, you, you, once you pop, you can't stop. What is it? I bet you can't eat just one. I mean, they're, they're literally engineered to overwhelm your brain. So that's, so I would push back on that. I think you eat when you're not even hungry, but not so much in societies where there aren't Pringles. Yeah. Although maybe honey, right? Um, yeah, maybe. That is, there, there are things that are very strong stimuli and, and yeah. I'll agree with you. I, I mean, Within our group, thanks to Richard McElrath, it's the Dorito, not the Pringle, that is the yeah. prototype of the non-food engineered product that's a super releaser for a bunch of, you know, yeah. um, a positive reward um, sensations. But um, uh, I think, um, you know, to turn that around, for example, right? I mean, um, uh, uh, ath it, you know, endurance athletes have to learn to fuel consciously, right? Or they bonk, that is, you yeah. know, they'll, they'll, they'll go into negative balance because they don't anticipate the rate at which, they, that is, they don't subjectively anticipate the rate at which they're burning energy, right? Yeah. Um, so, we, which does suggest that, you know, that that kind of, the consciousness that's floating on top of it is really pretty disconnected from the system that in, you yeah. know, EEA context would be making a lot of the decisions as it were, right? But, but that yeah. does actually, you know, kind of connect a little bit with the question that I plan to ask, which is the time scale for this 
plasticity, right? Yeah. So, I mean, you show us variation in a Hatsa diet over periods of many months or years, you show us, you know, the effects of these kinds of changes over, you know, decades in the lifespan using cross-sectional data, right? Uh, my question really is, um, how much do we know, if at all, about um, what you might think of as something like day-to-day -day or week-to-week adjustments in the trade-offs between um, uh, a, a, a TE yeah. and, and, and BMR. Because for example, just to, to point you to one question here, right? Um, so I conjectured a while ago and Jim Roney in, in much more careful work than mine subsequently documented that, you know, that human um, female energy intake has a periovulatory dip, which is not at all surprising since that's true of other mammals as well. And in other mammals, we see increases in activity level around that period in, 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 the, in the form of, you know, ranging behavior, presumably mm -hmm. in pursuit of mating opportunities, right? So you have a reduction in intake at the same time that you have, at least in other species, conceivably, possibly in us as well, no reduction in activity levels and probably an increase in activity levels. Yeah. And the, my question is, are you getting that, you know, is that line between BMR and, 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 and the rest of energy expenditure dropping then? Or is, is that where you're just, you know, you, that, that's just noise in the system, as it were, in the sense that, that it, 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 it can't adjust that fast and you're, you're just going into negative balance for a few years. Yeah, days. yeah, you can't adjust that fast. I mean, we don't know the timing very well yet, but it's over the course of, of weeks or months, probably. Um, not, you know, so even like even seasonal changes in energy expenditure and activity levels, you know, March is big and April's quiet and May is big and June is quiet. You might see fluctuations like there as well that, that, they, but that you can't ever quite match, right? So you end up kind of in this in the middle, right? If you, you can imagine an environment like that, um, where we see humans clearly adjusting in intervention studies are in studies that last more than four or five months. Anything shorter than that. And that's actually so another thing to think about. If you read, I don't know why you would bother, but if anybody <laughs> else is out there uh, painfully flipping through the, the exercise literature, uh, you know, you can get any result you want on an exercise study that's less than eight weeks. And you can get almost any exercise result you want on anything up to about four or five months. And it's really the long term stuff where you see the body getting some kind of stability. Uh, before that, it's all. It's the wild, wild west, and you can see all kinds of physiology happening. So I'd, I'd expect it to be over the, you know, I don't think you're going to see it over an ovulatory cycle, for example. I would be really shocked if you saw it that quickly. Makes sense. Yeah. Uh, Sean? Um, I was really struck by what seems like the lack of a sex difference on some of these energy yeah. parameters, especially given the all the all that's written about differential costs of reproduction and men and women, is it, is, is, are there meaningful sex differences or is it all just about fat-free mass? It's really all about fat-free mass. So men and women have different expenditures, but because it's because men are bigger and carry less fat as a percentage. Sorry, I'm still chasing the sun around here. You can see I'm getting blown out. Um, the, there's, um, oh, that might be finally better. You guys are getting a tour of my, my kitchen too. That's nice. You're welcome. Um, so there's no sex difference, uh, which is kind of shocking, actually, because uh, I agree. And actually, even just from first principles of forget activity levels and stuff like that, um, you know, reproductive systems are obviously very different. Um, and yet we don't see differences. So um, if you correct for fat-free mass and fat mass, there's no male and female differences in, uh, in, in metabolic rates. I don't know why but I would have expected it too, but you don't see it. It kind of makes you wonder where the, where, um, well, it depends. In, in a situation like the Hadza, where men are going, you know, 30% further every day, maybe 50% further every day, Brian, I don't know, then off the top of my head, then women are going on average, you'd expect to see a difference there and you don't. And is it because, well, women kind of absorb that difference in ranging distance by doing things that are inherently more strenuous, like carrying kids? Um, I don't know. I don't know. Cause you see the difference even in women who aren't pregnant and aren't nursing. So it isn't, you know, it isn't that, um, yeah. Does the, the, these databases that are now being compiled, uh, and, you know, have very impressive, you know, 
diverse diverse samples. They could, of course, be more uh, more diverse, and they could always be bigger. Yeah. Um, but could this also be a situation where, if you were to build a physics based prediction of male and female differences in energy expenditure, is that effect size thought to be big enough that we should have detected it by now? Is that your thinking? Or could there yet be some effects lurking in the data that just haven't been discovered because of the state that the, the data are in now? Yeah, I, I just, I mean, the, the biggest chunk of that data set of the 7,000 we have or whatever, the biggest bolus of data is in that 20 to 60 year old range. So that's a well sampled age range. Mm -hmm. And that's where we see no male female differences. Mm -hmm. um, we don't, the, the, the other differences we see are due to sort of timing of how you go up or come down that trajectory rather than necessarily static differences, I wouldn't say. But, but, but from 20 to 60, no difference. Mm -hmm. um, I haven't done the statistical power analysis to figure out what we could rule out, but um, I, I, I think it'd be quite small. I guess anyone could do that now if they were to contact the, the database sure. and download yeah. the data, you could you could see what sorts of, of models you could rule out on that. Sure, sure. I mean you could even I mean you could you're welcome to do that. So the way the database I should say the way that the database is run, it's um it's like there are other databases like this. I think UK Biobank is like this. You you can't just click a button and it, it just all downloads. You have to put an application in to ask to, to, for the data. Mm -hmm. Um and that gets vetted quickly through a by the management group, but we haven't turned any, we've never turned anybody down. And the, the presumption is you can do the analysis as long as, you know, you're playing, playing nice, basically. Mm -hmm. Great. Well, maybe we can uh, run through some of that as a stats example in a, in a evolution sure. anthropology class. That'd That's uh, and I, 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 we don't have too much time and usually we do end at one thirty. So I think um, now's a good time to wrap up. And, uh, and I just wanna thank you again, Herman, for, for being here. You guys can take yourself off mute and, and help me thank him for his presentation. It's been great to host you here. Of course, it would have been better in person to have you out here and uh, maybe, maybe that'll be possible in the, in, the, in the near future, so. That'd be awesome. Yeah, yeah, that'd be great. All right, well, thank you, Herman, and thank you everyone else. Uh, next week, uh, our speaker is going to be Jamie Jones. We're gonna get a big dose of evolutionary modeling of diffusion processes and pandemic uh, behavior related to such. So it should be a delightful talk. And, uh, and, and I look forward to seeing you all next week. All right, thank you very much. Thanks guys, bye.